bless others. All right, let's pick up the sermon today. We're going to end our series with the practice of growth. This is our final message in our series, and I want to show you uh, uh, something that, that Tracy Rice already knows. I am not allowed to use this, am I, Tracy? No, sir. Okay, now they'll maybe let me use a little bitty brush. They'll maybe let me use a roller outside. But my painting is so bad that the last time my small group came and helped me paint the inside of my house, they said, give me that. You just bring me paint and water. I'll be fine. But there's a movie that involves a giant paintbrush. And as I thought about growth, I thought this is how so many times we feel. We feel like we are painting the fence or sanding the deck or wax on, wax off. And we wonder, why in the world am I going through this and struggling with this and fighting this and we think it has no purpose and we're just going through trials and nothing good is going to come out of it. But I can tell you that even when you don't understand and there's things in life that are difficult and not fair. And sometimes you feel like Danielson. And the reason I couldn't show that clip is because he cusses at Mr. Miyagi. Right? Sometimes you feel that way. God, why? But if you'll let God use those difficult situations, those struggles, that loneliness, that trial, that difficult person, that situation where somebody said something to you and you're still trying to figure out if you'll let God use that you'll be stronger. And he'll use you then to bless other people. So I want to give you today three practices that will help you grow as a Christian and will help you through these hard times. And here they are. First, rest. Rodney talked about that a little bit. Then reprogramming and then uh, reaching out to Jesus. So if you're tired, if you're feeling stressed, should I get a show of hands or should we be good, right? If you're tired, if you're feeling stressed, if you are, have a hard time with negative thinking or you get discouraged all the time, my prayer is that this message and the verses that are used in the book of Hebrews will help you and encourage you today. Number one, rest from your works by faith and grace. With that, I'm going to rest. Therefore, it says in Hebrews chapter four, if you have your Bible, you can open to Hebrews chapter four. It'll be on the screen. You can look it up later. We're not going to read every verse in this chapter, but we're going to start right here. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Time out. So in the Greek, when it says entering his rest, that word for rest in the Greek means to still the winds or to still the waters. I, I think of it like Jesus standing up in the boat with the disciples and going, peace, be still. Have you entered that kind of rest with God? And then he continues, for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us. What's the good news? That Jesus died and forgave our sins. That it's not by works that we're saved, but it's by grace. And it continues, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they didn't share the faith of those who obeyed. You can hear God's word. You can know about God's word. But until you put your faith in Christ, it doesn't change you. It's just hearing words in your head. And I did that for many years in church. Now, we who have believed enter that rest just as God said. So I declared an oath in my anger. They will never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. And then a few verses later, it says this. There remains then a Sabbath Rest. By the way, we have some missionaries that are part of our church now that used to, in Israel, have the Sabbath. They said that's one of the things they miss the most because all of a sudden, no cars, no businesses, no noise, one day a week of just rest. They said it's, it's hard to get used to just American go, go, go. And the truth is, all of us can have rest in Christ, even in our busyness. And it continues... For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Just as God did from his, him, his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. That seems opposite. Like, let's try to rest. But you do have to try to rest, don't you? 
Haven't you ever been up at night and you wanted to sleep, and the more you tried to sleep, the frustrated, more frustrated you got, and the less you could rest? Well, then what do we need to do? It continues so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. So what is this verse talking about? In Hebrews, the author, which may have been Paul, was talking about how the Pharisees and even Christians who practice pharisaical law started saying, hey, in order to be a Christian, you got to do all this stuff. And they took that yoke of the Pharisees, which was a heavy yoke, and they put it on people. And the author here is trying to remind us, no, no, no. He said his burden is light. So what does that mean? It's not by your works that you're saved. It's by his grace. But Eric, that's not fair. I feel like I need to do something to earn my way to God. Yes, that's natural in our flesh. Every religion except for Christianity says, work your way to God and maybe, just maybe he'll love you. And the enemy will even come to you if you're a Christian and say, "Ah, you don't deserve God's love. And let me give you the answer for that. Okay, every once in a while, especially my family will say to me, you realize you don't deserve your wife. Carl, you've been told that before, haven't you? By your wife. Okay, so, so every once in a while they'll say, you don't deserve your wife. And let me tell you what I tell them. You're exactly right. I don't, but I'm blessed. You don't deserve God's love. When they say that, you say, you're right. When you say that to yourself, I don't deserve God's love, you need to answer yourself. I'm right. I don't. But the Bible says God so loved the world. He absolutely loves you. He cares about you. You matter. And so on those days where you feel like, but, but I failed, I messed up, I blew it. By the way, God's never surprised by your failure. He doesn't say, you did what? Had no idea that you would do that. When, Ad, when God came for Adam and Eve and said, where are you? He knew where they were. He wanted them to know where they are. And the reason for confession is so that we can know where we are. There's two ways in life to work. But let me read this, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. What is faith? Trusting in Jesus. Jesus, I know you'll save me. I surrender my life to you. And this isn't from yourself. It's a gift of God, not by works. So nobody can boast. So even if you are the most religious person in here, you can't boast anyway. Because what happens as a Christian is... Our relationship is what leads to works. It's not our works that lead to relationship. And that is the biggest difference between Christianity. Let me me give you an example. I got lots of stumps in my yard. Stumps everywhere. There were a lot of trees cut down. Apparently there was a hurricane and they left all the trees this tall. Right? They cut down the trees, they left the stumps. Carl's been to my house, I got about a million stumps. And a guy from our church, I was trying to cut him up, and oh, it was miserable. I'd take my chainsaw and just, and I'm like, this is not going to work. I'd drill into them. Somebody said, you can put this powder in them, and they'll melt. No. And then somebody from our church said, you know what you do? You get a, a basket. You put charcoal in the basket, and you light that. You add diesel. I shouldn't tell you that part. And, and then you light it, and you leave it, and you watch it. I can tell you, so much more work got done when I rested in the chair with my Gatorade and watched it burn. Mmm, mmm, delicious. When it was done burning, I pulled, and guess what? It was finished. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Which means that all these things you try to do to earn your way to God, hey, that's not how you get there. You surrender to him, and then what happens? Fruit becomes natural. If you're struggling in your behavior, then it has more to do with your relationship with God than it has to do with you being a good or not good person. Sometimes we just have to rest in him and say, God, I can't overcome anything on my own. I need your help. Life is full of little bitty choices. And the main choice we make every day is, God, I'm going to rest in you today. God, when I get frustrated and I'm upset that I drove the way I did today or that person cut me off or I couldn't deal with this situation, well, Father, I trust you. Number two, reprogram your thoughts with his word. Now, I don't know if you heard years ago how they used to train elephants in the circus. 
When the elephant was a little baby, they would take a little rope, tie it around the elephant's leg, and, and put a stake in the ground, take the mama away, and of course the baby would try to get to the mama and would try and try and try, and it would bleed from the rope. And finally, the little baby elephant would quit trying. And so every day they would just keep that rope on the elephant and the elephant would grow and grow and grow and finally it was a giant elephant. And if that elephant wanted to, it could have just picked up his leg, pulled that stake and taken it all the way across the world. But that elephant didn't know that. That elephant thought like it had always thought and so it stayed right where it stayed. Listen. The enemy wants you to stay where you've always been. Even if you're a Christian, even if you love God, even if you understand you're forgiven, he wants you to stay back in the, I'm a failure, I, I, I can't do anything right. Uh, somebody told you years ago maybe that you were worthless. So how do I get past that? How do I realize I have worth? How do I realize that God loves me? How do I realize that he cares for me? How do I realize that he wants the best for me? And so the commands he puts into place for me have to do with the best for me. How does, do I get reprogrammed? I read God's word. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive, active, sharper than any double-edged sword. That's pretty sharp. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges not only the thoughts, but the attitudes. By the way, I can't judge your attitude. I can't judge your thoughts. You can come to me and go, Pastor Eric, that was such a good sermon today. And then on your way home, go, that was the worst sermon I have ever heard in my life. You can be on the way to church, fight with your spouse all the way here. Oh, Pastor, hey, Pastor Eric, good to see you. I don't know the thoughts and intention of your heart, but God's word does. So sometimes when I'm reading God's word and you're in church, you'll say something like, did you tell him? I, I've literally had people text me or call me or message me. Did my spouse tell you what happened this week? Because that story was exactly what happened in our house. And I typically want to answer, yes, they did. That one was for you. I did the entire sermon based on your marriage. But I don't say that because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. I say, no. But God knew. And that's what God's word does. What does it do? It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And then it says this, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. So he knew where Adam and Eve were. He created the universe. And then he said, where are you? You ever give that a lot of thought? You, you think he really couldn't see through the bushes? Everything's uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, we view trials and we say, I can't do this. And, and sometimes some well-meaning person will say to you, God never gives you anything that you can't handle. Don't you worry. He doesn't give you more than you can carry. And you don't have to rebuke them. You just nod at them next time they say that because they're trying to be nice. But let me tell you the truth. God will give you things that you cannot handle without him. And the purpose of that is so you will go to him. And you'll allow his word to change you. And that's why the Bible says, I can do all things. And then it says, through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Because on your own, you're out of strength. You're out of patience. My driving will never get better. Right? Amen. Right? But, but, but you ride with me, and, and Neil Ricketts will even tell you, Eric, you're so much better than you talk about. I go, yeah, but I'm still struggling up here. Right? And the truth is why he's working on us little by little. Romans 12, 2 tells us how this happens. Do not be conformed to the pattern of the world. What does the world tell you? You're worthless. Do whatever you want. Because this is just, you know, you're just a, a hunk of meat. Just do whatever you want. You don't matter. Or you're everything. The world centers around you. You know, we all know those people too. It says, do not conform to the pattern of the world. And then it says this, but be transformed. In the Greek, this is the word metamorphosis. It's what happens from a worm to a butterfly. Be transformed. How do we get transformed? By the renewing of your mind. How does that happen? As you spend time in his word. As you let God's word change you. Listen, if you're struggling with anger, go in the Bible and look up anger. And just print out some verse on anger and start to memorize a couple of those verses. And God will work on you. 
If you struggle with self-esteem, print some verses about how God loves you and cares about you, how you are precious. Let him transform how you think because somebody told you you were worthless. So you need to be reprogrammed. Why? By reading the owner's manual. And then it says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, when you're running on your own, you tend to think, well, I know how this goes. And so you put together the grill, and you don't look at the directions, and then you find a bunch of bolts. Or like me, you put something on upside down, you have to take the whole thing back apart. I did that, put the whole grill together, two hours, and I had one part upside down in step number two. And took the whole thing apart. Done that? Okay, thank you. Glad, glad I'm not the only idiot in the room. All right, so anyway, and that's how we live life without God's Word. I'm just going to do what feels right. I'm going to do what feels good. I'm going to do what makes me feel better. But if we want to live life right, we have to allow God's Word to transform even how we think about other people. Did you know that person that you don't like is valuable to God? That person you're struggling with is valuable to God. If you want to be able to be gracious with people and loving towards people, you have to realize they're valuable. It doesn't mean you don't have to give them boundaries, but you can lovingly give them boundaries. One of the main ways we move from abstract knowledge about God to a personal encounter with Him as a living reality is through the furnace of affliction. When you go through a hard time, when you go through a struggle, you have a choice. I give up. I'm not going to change. I'm going to do what I've always done. Mr. Miyagi, I'm not being trained anymore, right? Or you say, God, I know you're teaching me something. Help me to know what I'm supposed to learn in this trial and this struggle. Number three, reach for him in the pain. And here's how you can know about you. What do you reach for when you're frustrated, sad, discouraged, tired, irritated? What do you reach for? Chocolate. Somebody yelled chocolate. That was awesome. What do you reach for? Okay, alcoholic will reach for alcohol. TV-aholic will reach for TV. Some of us reach for Facebook. Some of us reach for gossip. Some of us might even reach for music. What do we reach for when we feel the pain? It's okay to have friends. It's okay to have people to talk to. It's good to have an accountability group. It's good to have a small group. All of that is good. But our first thing needs to be to reach for Jesus. Gosh. Lord, I need your help today. God, I could reach for these other things. I could reach for alcohol. I could reach for drugs. I could reach for entertainment. I could reach for, for Facebook. I could reach for approval from people and try to get that from other people. Or first, I can reach for you. Romans 12, 21 says this, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with more evil. Overcome evil by getting mad about it. Overcome evil by watching more news. <laughs> overcome evil with good. You know what? Sometimes we need to walk away from our TVs. Sometimes we need to walk away from our Facebook, our Twitter, all those things. And we need to walk out and just bless somebody. Do something to bless them, whatever it may be. It could be something simple. It might be sending somebody a note. It, it might be going to your neighbor's house and bringing them soup or checking on them or just calling somebody and saying, how are you doing? You doing okay? Overcome evil with good. Therefore, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, Since we have a high, great high priest, that's talking about Jesus, our high priest, who's ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let's hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. I'll come back to that in a minute. But we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. With confidence? So that we may receive mercy. And then listen to this. Find grace to help us in our time of need. Are you in need? Do you need help? Do you feel weakless and worthless? Jesus understands. When my father committed suicide years ago, I'll never forget a pastor who called me. I had two different main experiences that I really remember. A pastor that called me that knew me. And he said, I know how you feel. And then he went on to talk about this uncle he hardly knew that took his life. And I remember hanging up the phone and thinking, you have no idea how I feel. And then I remember that my, after my dad's funeral, as I walked out the back door, I got right near the back doors, and a man named, uh, uh, oh gosh, Mr. Hutchins, Bobby Hutchins, grabbed me by my shoulders, looked me right in the eyes. I'm hard to get attention from, by the way. 
looked me right in the eyes and he said this, I want you to know, I understand what you're going through. My dad did the exact same thing when I was your age. I've never forgotten that. I knew he know, knew exactly how I felt. I've never forgotten that. I knew that he understood. Anytime I saw him, I thought, that guy's praying for me and he knows how to pray for me. Hey, the Bible says that Jesus has gone through every emotion, every feeling, every trial you've gone through, and he understands so that when you pray, you don't have to be like, God, I know you have no clue what I'm talking about. No. He totally and completely understands. If you're tired, if you're struggling, if you're feeling stress, find rest in him, change your thinking, and most of all, reach out to him first. There's other things, I get it, but reach first to him. God, I need your help. There's other people who help you. I'll help you on your journey. You can send me a note, pray for you, encourage you, but reach for him first. If you're here today or you're watching online, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. The Bible says, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. That's talking about Jesus, that whoever... That includes you, whoever believes in him. And that word for belief is the word faith. It's not just a mental understanding. It's whoever trusts in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's the idea that you won't die. And the cool thing is you start to live because the Holy Spirit, when you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, I surrender my life to you knowing you died and rose again, and I want to follow you the rest of my life. When you do that and mean it, whether it's a prayer or a conversation, The Bible says he exchanges your sin for his righteousness. The Holy Spirit comes in you and helps you to do the very things we talked about today. If you want that relationship, you can come talk to me after service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. If you're here and you're a Christian, but the truth is you reach for a lot of other things, hey, God, I'm going to trust you in this trial. I don't understand you, but I trust you. Let's pray today. Father, thank you for these moments together. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love. Thank you that you meet us right where we are. Thank you that you love us just like we are. Father, thank you that you know all of our weakness, all of our failures, all of our negative thinking, and you absolutely love us. Father, thank you for that. Lord, I pray for that one today who's struggling with even feeling good about themselves today, that they would receive your mercy and grace. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.